so our, and, and thanks for that presentation. It's really good, really good to learn from. So our, our next presenter is uh, Martin. He's uh, actually a student here at, uh, oh, okay. So Michael's gonna go next. So leaving order. So uh, Michael Ellis is going, going to present next to us. He is um, visiting us. He's, he's working with Dr. Lin. He's visiting from uh, University of Kansas uh, School of Medicine. And he's going to be talking about conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. So thanks, Michael. So as Dr. Stagg mentioned, my name is Michael Ellis. I appreciate the opportunity to present today, and I'll be presenting on uh, the topic of conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. So just to give some background before we go into a, a case, it's the most con uh, common conjunctival malignancy in the United States, um, and it's common referred under the umbrella term ocular surface squamous neoplasia in the literature. When you think about it, uh, think, of, think back to your pathology, we think back to the full thickness epithelial involvement uh, without penetration into the basement membrane and subsequently the substantial propria and that would be uh, conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. So common symptoms that patients present with redness, foreign body sensation, and even mild, just mild irritation, but up to 30% of patients can actually be asymptomatic. So the case that I was involved with with Dr. Lim, uh, she was consulted by an outside plastic surgeon for a 35 year old female with a precancerous lesion on the conjunctiva, confirmed to be conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia through biopsy. From the patient's history, the patient was born blind, had juvenile cataracts, aniridia, nystagmus, and several anterior segment abnormalities. Now at the time of the chart review, a genetic syndrome had not been identified, um, but, thir but through literature review, uh, it is possible that this could be a PAC6 uh, mutation, which PAC6 has been implicated in uh, ocular development, <coughs> and that will come into play as I s uh, discuss risk factors. Um, and then also, a prior orbital CT had showed optic nerve coloboma, shallow orbits, and some proptosis, but no other masses. So what are some other diagnostic options besides your biopsy? So biopsy is the gold standard, but it also puts the patient at an, uh, sometimes an unnecessary risk if, if you're wrong. And so cytology is a relatively non-invasive method that's been described since the 50s. Um, so impression cytology uh, can, be, uh, can be useful by uh, the use of cellulose acetate filter paper or biopore membrane device. And there's been a published correlation rate with histology of 77 to 80%. Uh, there's also something called the Barrows method of doing the impression cytology, and that can have a sensitivity up to 95%. Other diagnostic options that are available include high resolution anterior segment ultrasound, uh, microscopy, and OCT. So risk factors. So one of the most common risk factors would be exposure to ultraviolet uh, B light. HPV has been implicated, AIDS. A genetic predisposition to xeroderma pigmentosa and kind of playing into that, that failure or delay in DNA, DNA repair. So that PAC6 mutation that I suspect has been implicated with other uh, DNA mutations. And so perhaps there is a component um, in our patient of that. So chronic irritation. Um, heavy smoking and exposure to petroleum products have also been implicated. So on exam, uh, our patient is no light perception in the right eye, unfortunately, and light, only light perception in the left eye. We're unable to examine the pupils, and some nystagmus has been noted um, with the extraocular muscles, which is also a feature of the PAC6 mutation. Um, on external exam, she had light ophthalmos in both eyes and telecanthus. So most notably on her slit lamp exam, uh, she had two plus injection inferior uh, with irregular papillomatous elevated le uh, lesion, inferior extending temporally, approximately 15 millimeters horizontally going down into the fornix. Uh, the lesion also encroached upon the cornea, approximately two millimeters with associated neovascularization. And you can also note the uh, associated uh <coughs> congenital abnormalities such as the coloboma and the juvenile cataract. So this is a, a picture um, in the public domain of conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia. Uh, I wanted to show a picture of something that had been uh, diagnosed before treatment. And I, I have a picture of our patient and subsequent slides. So 
it, can anybody comment on uh, differential diagnosis of if you see something like this in the clinic, what you're likely to think? That's great, thank you. Uh, so here's just a list of some of the things that I came up with as well. Um, so Dr. Swan uh, just gave us a great summary of, of some of the things to be thinking about. Um, when you think about papilloma, conjunctival and trapezoidal neoplasia, and invasive squamous cell carcinoma, the conjunctiva, pretty difficult to differentiate those two just by looking at it. Um, would probably require biopsy or pressure and cytology um, to get the, the correct diagnoses. But here's a list of some other ones. Uh, and you mentioned lymphoma, and then also I, I, I read that Kaposi sarcoma could be something that could be considered um, in this case as well. And here's just here's a picture of a pterygium and a nevus, which has also been uh, noted to be in the differential, and then episcleritis. So what do we do for our patients? So the patient treatment, uh, we recommended topical interferon 1 million uh, units uh, per milliliter four times daily for at least three months. So because that, uh, our patient had lag of almost and that irritation, uh, we also recommended continuing the artificial tears four times a day. And the patient had been uh, previously put on uh, neomycin polymyxin, and we recommended that she continue that. So I'd just like to discuss a few of the treatment options. So this is kind of a landmark study by Tabin and others in 1997, um, which pointed out a 33% recurrence rate with just excision alone, even if the margins were cleared and a 56% recurrence rate for incompletely excised lesions. So the most common position for these lesions to develop is on the limbus, specifically in the nasal portion of the eye. And so they house the corneal stem cells, and, and that can lead to uh, stem cell deficiency. Also, cryotherapy and brachytherapy have been uh, reported in the literature, but have been associated with uh, negative side effects such as uh, symblepharon, iritis, corneal edema, atropion, conjunctival telangiectasia, scleral ulceration, among others. So the other, a, as you look through the literature, they really, uh, most, most papers lump together conjunctival and trapezoidal neoplasia with the dysplasia and the squamous cell carcinoma under that umbrella term, ocular surface squamous neoplasia. So there has been no head-to-head -head studies comparing mitomycin C5 fluorouracil and recombinant interferon, but a review article in 2013 by Nanji and others uh, found that the comparison through the literature, uh, interferon alpha <coughs> 2b has been found to have the least side effects while, ma while maintaining comparable rates of resolution and recurrence, with the only downside of price. So when I looked up the price of this drug, it's about $800 for 3.2 milliliters. <coughs> so another, just another study illustrating the effectiveness of topical interferon. Um, there was an association of people living in areas like the coast with higher UV levels uh, that re resulted in slower clinical resolution rates. And an association was found between the size of the lesion at, at that third month and treatment duration. So other things that have been tried, uh, topical bevacizumab, there's been a couple of different studies looking at that, um, but no level one, level two evidence. So I've just listed a couple <coughs> case series up here. Uh, so a study by Oskin and others looked at 10 eyes using uh, 25 milligrams per milliliter bevacizumab for a mean of 7.8 weeks. Um, and, and most notably, all patients ended up going, uh, undergoing uh, subsequent excisional biopsy, cryotherapy, and amnion membrane transplantation. But no recurrences were noted for six months after surgery, and no significant local or systemic side effects were noted. As well as another study, a June 2015 publication, by Asena and others uh, found a mean reduction in tumor area of 43% in one month and 68% uh, in two months with also no systemic or uh, visual side effects. So there's also been reports of uh, injecting bevacizumab and that, that has shown some 
some efficacy as well, but it also puts our patients at, at um, risk of uh, side effects from the injection. And there's also been uh, st studies looking at subconjunctival ranibizumab, but has only been effective with multiple injections. So just some patient follow-up. Uh, she's improved on the topical interferon for the two months, but she still has uh, significant conjuncti conjunctival colasis, um, and it may require excision in, within the next few months. Her, her eye is becoming more red, according to the family, um, in, associating with, in association with that lag ophthalmos noted on exam. So here's a picture from the clinic um, on the day that I saw the patient. And if you can make it out, you, like you can see in the inferior and limbal areas that there is that lesion there um, extending superior temporally. temporally. So follow-up, she remains um, on the interferon drops four times daily. And uh, the, she had just finished the neomycin uh, polymyxin ointment. So we decided to restart uh, maxitrol ointment at night, artificial tears five times daily, and return to clinic in one month uh, to reevaluate the need for surgery. There are my references. And thank you, Dr. Lynn, for your help. I can't comment on why the plastic surgeon specifically started the antibiotics, but the patient does uh, have lag ophthalmos and had the redness and the irritation, and so I suspect that's why. Yeah, the, the literature that I read suggested that it is indeed effective. However, 100% of patients do have the side effects of myalgias and fevers, and they're ra rather unfavorable. So that's, that's why they recommended more like the topical. <laughs> 